Hey everyone, welcome back to French Creek Farmhouse. I'm Christy. And I'm Rob. And today we're continuing our adventures in dahlia planting. So in our last video, you saw us planting in raised beds. In the past, we've only planted in ground. So that's an experiment for us this year with the raised beds. We want to experiment a little bit more and we're going to try growing dahlias in grow bags. So let's take a look at what grow bags are. So these grow bags are made with a really thick felt and they have a nice sewn on handle that has really thick stitching. I don't know how the handles are going to hold up once the bags are filled. We purchased the 10 gallon bags. I think technically you could probably grow dahlias in a 7 gallon bag and you could save a little bit of soil, but we wanted to err on the side of caution and make sure that we really had enough soil in the bag. So 10 gallons was just a safer bet. Um, so we're actually planning not to fill them and lift them because we feel like that has a possibility for tearing even though the stitching seems really good um, and the felt is very thick like you, you definitely couldn't just tear these um, at all. Uh, so we're going to place them right behind me here and then fill them up halfway or roughly and then place our tubers in and fill them up the rest of the way. So what we've planned to do and we planned for this last year we knew we were going to try out this experiment is we're going to be planting our compact varieties primarily because they are smaller plants they don't require any staking um, so we're going, we, we uh, extended our irrigation down and left it coiled at the end of the row so that we knew we would have enough and then we can sort of treat these if we set them all side by side as you know, a version of a raised bed. And then we'll just irrigate them the same way we do with our raised beds. Right now we have crates full of daffodils from the spring that we'll need to get rid of before we can place these in and start filling them up. We purchased a hundred bags. I, we're gonna do somewhere, I have 80 on my list, but it might be a little bit more, so we w went with a little bit extra just in case. Primarily the compact varieties, but we are going to try out a few of just standard height varieties as well and see what happens because we don't know. I mean, this could be a good option. We have some theories about why this might work, and then we also have some fears about why it possibly won't. But one idea is the fact that because these are black, these absorb heat, and dahlias do enjoy warm soil. So the idea here would be possibly that we might be able to start planting our dahlias a little bit earlier in the season because where we live, uh, the soil doesn't usually warm up enough for us to plant until right around Mother's Day. But if we had these bags ready to go, it's possible that we might be able to plant these maybe just a week or two weeks earlier in the future. We're not sure, but if this is a test year and we're trying them out. Next year, we'll iterate and see if we can plant a little bit sooner if we like how things work in the bag. Things that we don't know how it's going to work is things like how it's going to happen, you know, what's going to happen at harvesting time. Are these going to be really difficult to harvest tubers out of? Um, they'll, they'll be fine for harvesting cut flowers, I imagine, but tubers could be a different story. Will they get too hot and then cook the plants and bake those, those little feeder roots that are inside the bag? We don't know that either. Um, so it is definitely an experiment it's a risk to some extent but if there's time to do it this is the time we don't we don't really want to wait until we're farther in to be um, you know testing out some of these bigger ideas um, of course you're always going to be iterating and testing when you're doing something like this but we just figured we might as well jump in and try all the different methods while we have the opportunity to do it so Rob's gonna be bringing over wheelbarrow fulls full of soil and we're gonna start getting these filled up
Well, you brought up a very good fact as we're filling these grow bags, is that possibly we should lay out a, a plastic um, liner to keep the grass from growing up in between the grow bags. And uh, that's a good point. Um, the grass typically grows well here in the summertime, in spring and summer, and uh, yeah. And I think I'm Illinois just because I hate, I like doing things slow and the correct way because it saves time later. And now we, if we do that, which makes sense, we have to move everything and it's just kind of, it's kind of probably push us back, I don't know, half an hour, not a big deal. But yeah, it's one of those things that's kind of annoying. Anyway, <laughs> the smile is deceiving, trust me. I mean, yeah, this is, I don't enjoy when these mistakes happen. I mean, I don't know if it's a mistake or just an afterthought of like, once we could see that there's this little shape in between each of the grow bags, you know, and you can see grass growing down there. It's pretty obvious that, you know, we need to address that. Uh, so it's too bad we didn't think of it before. I mean, we use landscape fabric on all of our beds for weed prevention. Well, not all, but the major, like our in-ground beds for sure for weed prevention. So um, it's not a big deal. We have tons of it. Um, so it's six foot width and we'll just roll it out. It'll actually cover into this uh, aisle that's next to this bed. So that's a good thing too, because it'll cut down on weeds there. Um, so we'll just roll it out. I mean, it's a... You know, I, I, I don't like the fact that we already planted some of these tubers in there and I don't know what moving these grow bags could potentially do to the sprouts that were coming off of those tubers. Um, so we're just going to keep our fingers crossed that we don't have any breakage or problems. I mean, if a sprout breaks off, it's not a big deal because the tuber will send up new sprouts from, from, from itself, you know, if that happens, as long as it doesn't, you know, destroy the eye in the process. So it's not a huge deal. Um, so one thing about using this landscape fabric is that you never want to cut it. You always want to burn it. If you cut it, it will leave just tons and tons of little uh, plastic threads. So you always want to use a torch to effectively cut this, this fabric. So we use a little culinary torch. I'll link it down below. Super easy to do. So we're going to move these bags that we already started, roll this out, put the bags back on top of the fabric and then continue on. So in the big scheme of things, that was a rather minor mistake. It actually didn't take us as long to fix as we thought it was going to. I mean, it was only like six and a half bags into it. Thank, thank goodness, because I envisioned having 80 bags into it that would I would have cried. Yeah, if we had had to do like very many more. And the other thing is that we actually managed to learn that you can pick up these bags once they're filled with 10 gallons of soil. It's not pleasant. Like I wouldn't want to fill these up and then move them to their location because they are very heavy. But you can do it, and the handles, there, there was no, you didn't even hear any, like, straining yeah, of the no, seams. You don't give. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems stable. I, I think the uh, tubers probably were fine. Um, we were yeah. gentle, but I think it wasn't, you know, impactful to them. So the positive is we actually got to test out the bags a little bit more and know that uh, what we're capable of doing with them. And, you know, sometimes mistakes lead to finding out great information, I guess. So I'm not trying to silver lining every single thing because I think that, yeah, sometimes things just suck. And, and this is one of those things that we were like, oh, man, I can't believe we forgot or you know didn't think of this beforehand. But in the big scheme of things, this turned out to be not such a bad experience. And it's always worth it to do it right because otherwise throughout the entire spring and summer we would have been dealing with weeds and grass and it yeah. was way worse so it's always better to do it the right way yeah sometimes it's tempting to just say oh i'll just live with it for now and no. you know because you don't want to do the work right now but it is better just to invest that work now than to pay for it for you know months on end we have definitely learned that over time so let's get back to filling the bags 
Okay, so it's been a little over a month since we planted our dahlias into the grow bags. So it's time to just have a little bit of an update on this experiment. So we planted 90 dahlias into the grow bags, which is um, you know not quite a quarter of our total stock. We have 408 dahlias this year, so 90 went into the grow bags. And of those 90, at this point, we've had 63 sprout. So that's 70%. Um, you know, I would say, like if I looked at those numbers traditionally, if we were looking at a 30% rate of failure, I would say we are failing. Um, there's some reasons why I wanna sort of like discount that number a little bit. Cause like our normal failure rate when we plant, like we expect, um, you know, up to 15% of our tubers to not make it basically either they don't come out of the ground, they get eaten, like some kind of a problem. Um, last year we had like 10%. So. Um, there can be lots of, you know, weather conditions in Mother Nature that gets involved to affect that number. So we're looking at like two to three times our normal rate of failure on the dahlias. However, there are some things that come into play there. So, so one of the things for sure is that I intentionally planted some tubers that were, I mean, shall we say questionable, right? Like. I maybe I didn't see in a sprouted eye on them um, but I thought why not toss them in and kind of see what happens maybe I just d couldn't see it or it just hadn't swelled enough yet or whatever and, and we had the bags and we had the right the compost so we figured okay let's just see we weren't gonna waste our bed space like our square footage space on planting those questionable tubers because that didn't make any sense um, but since we had the extra bags and we had we have we have dirt um, you know why not throw them in and see what happens so I think that's definitely playing a role the mistake I made though I will say is not having kept track of how many of those tubers were questionable so that I could factor those into the numbers and get a little bit better idea of um, what our success rate is. As we experiment, we want to kind of like keep track of this. Um, and, and that would have been ideal to do, okay, these are the ones we're not positive to see what maybe didn't sprout. Yeah. And then we could take that out of our numbers yeah. knowing that there were questionable tubers. That would have definitely been good information to have. Um, and then, so we kind of looked at like, some some different things that might be coming into play because the one thing that we noticed when we looked at the tubers that have sprouted already is that um, we see them at sort of different stages of growth which is different than what's happening in our raised beds where like from variety to variety right so if we planted a variety then all of that variety is kind of at about the same height and most of those tubers are at about the two to you know two foot mark some of them are at the three foot mark um, like the dinner plate varieties definitely are taller um, and then what we're seeing in the raised bags is that same variety of a plant in different bags. We have some that are like literally just breaking the surface right now. We have some that are like six inches tall. We have some that are a foot tall. And that's like bag next to bag next to mm -hmm. bag. They're not like spread out in different areas or something like that. We, we thought that po possibly some were receiving more sun, yeah. some were, you know, just different environments where they're located. Slightly but, different conditions. But you would expect then that these cluster would have more growth because there's more sun and these maybe have have a little bit less growth we're not seeing that it's it's kind of more randomized randomized right now and what we actually didn't show in the video is that we do have um six additional bags that we have sitting right next to our raised beds 
And so they aren't in a separate part of our farm. They're literally right in this, getting the exact same conditions that our raised beds are getting. And we're seeing the same thing happen with those six bags where they were slower to come up than what our raised beds were. Our raised beds, you know, well, I mean, generally, I mean, in the past too, the dahlias that we plant, it's like two to three weeks before you get a sprout. And, you know, what we're seeing is some, you know, over a month now, and some of them are just sprouting in the raised bags. So that, that doesn't quite make sense to us, but we have some theories on that too, because we were reflecting on, you know, was there anything that we did differently with the raised bags that we did with the, or with, with the grow bags than we did with the raised beds. And the one thing that we realized is that we amend our raised beds with a starter fertilizer. We use Biotone for that. And we did not do that with the grow bags. No, no. And that's a major, major uh, difference. So. I, maybe I'm, it's maybe a major right, difference. Right, right. It's definitely something we did differently. Yeah, I, I, one one of the issues with this experiment is that we have multiple different variables, mm -hmm. and obviously you don't want to have that when you're really trying to understand what works and what doesn't work. So we yeah. didn't really control those as much as we probably should have, as we're now trying to figure out why there might be a little bit um, of a you know higher failure rate yeah. with the growth. Yeah, so if I took out the, you know, if I was able to take out the number of the questionable tubers, um, you know, actually we might be, I, I don't know what that number is, but I'm just assuming that then we might be in a range that would have been acceptable for us in terms of our normal failure rate. So I guess if I was looking at it on, does it work to grow dahlias in grow bags? I mean, absolutely it does. They're growing, right? Um, they're just not growing at the same rate and sprouting at the same time as the ones that we planted in our raised beds. So did the starter fertilizer have something to do with that? I mean, I would say, I would, I mean, just like theoretically, I would say it probably does have something to do with that because the starter fertilizer has nitrogen in it and nitrogen promotes um, green growth, right? It um, helps the plant make leaves and, and sprout and things like that. And so um, that certainly could play a role. The other thing that we've thought about is moisture retention. Mm -hmm. You know, our raised beds, um, I mean, so we kind of thought when we planted in the grow bags that it was going to effectively be like a raised bed because we put the grow bags like right next to each other, right? But the, but it's not because they are contained in their own bags and so, um, and they're black. So they absorb the heat and it's certainly warm. Like if you put your hand on to mm -hmm. the soil in the grow bags, the soil is very warm to the touch, um, which is different than our raised bed. It's a gallon size. 10 gallon. 10 gallon size. 10 <laughs> gallon size. Right. And and so that's it's a it's a little contained 10 gallon you know grow bag and so I think that soil is heating up. It's it's holding on to the heat longer than your normal raised beds, which is, you know, a much larger capacity. So I think that's playing a role too for sure. Yeah. So I think they just, just the evaporative, you know, there's just not as much um, humidity in um, or moisture in, in those grow bags, mm -hmm. probably because it's not um, the same environment as what would be in the raised beds where you have the entire bed filled with soil. Um, so that, I think that's certainly part of it. And then the, the soil mixture that we use uh, has sand in it for, to help with drainage because we don't want our dahlias to be waterlogged. They don't like that. Um, so that mixture in the grow bag might not be as good as it is in the raised bed. Um, that, that could definitely be playing a role too. But you know, like Rob said, we have multiple variables going on, which isn't ideal when you're trying to test out what works and what doesn't. But that brings us to our next point. And before I get to it, I want to just for people who are new to our channel or new to our story, don't know what we're doing. Um, you can definitely go back to our season two opener where we talked about going from homestead to farmstead and what we're attempting to do with this five year farming plan journey that we have. I'm a postdoc researcher. Um, I studied uh, psychosocial development and Rob has 27 years of experience as an educator and um, a science background as well. So um, we, you know, we, we basically got to a point, I think like a lot of people did in the pandemic where we wanted to, you know, have some more control over the, the direction of our family's life and what we were doing and not maybe be so dependent on, I mean, just honestly, like the W-2 lifestyle, right? We wanted to have um, some more freedom. Yeah, and I and some of that freedom is also just being freedom of, of being outside, which is what we love. And, you know, having that flexibility of, of, of when we're getting stuff done and how it kind of 
interacts and balances with our family life. Um, so, so that's kind of what we were searching for. Yeah. So we decided, you know, why not use the land that we have? You know, we've been <clears throat> on this sort of like, uh, you know, modern homesteading adventure for quite a while and growing for ourselves and our own needs. And then we thought, you know, why not use our land to be income producing and, you know, potentially, um, you know, sustaining in some ways through farming. But everything that we're doing is an experiment. I mean, we certainly take the advice and the wisdom of people who have gone before us but we also i mean there is a different idea from like every expert right and so mm -hmm. i think it's important to then test those ideas and see what works for you and that's what we're in the process of so the vlogs that we post every week are really about experimentation and trying out different methods and seeing what works best for us for our climate you know all the goals that we have for our farm and then a big part of that you know we kind of decided to document this this life experiment along with it and um, you know us sort of going from uh, you know living a, a more like traditional work life to creating a farm and and kind of starting our own path and going our own way and I mean that that came from like my own research um, you know when I was doing my doctorate and in, in realizing that we were a prime example, we could like test the theories that came out of my own research on ourselves. And so we decided, well, let's do that in front of you guys as well. So, so part of this theory for us is the idea, um, and, and if you're like, if you have any sort of project management background, you might recognize this, but it's that fail forward fast idea, you know, like fail fast, fail often and fail forward. So what does that mean? Okay. Um, you know, it's about experimenting, right? So the idea in project management comes from, you know, chunking down experiments into something that's smaller and can be tested more frequently rather than, um, and at a lower cost, right? And, and cost not just mean like financial cost, but like, it, you know, your total investment, right? Um, versus holding something up and, and kind of taking a big swing and then, you know, putting a huge investment into it over a long amount of time and then having the potential of failure because whenever you're experimenting you're going to experience failure and so if you you know can break that down and do things um, quickly and iteratively and then taking the information because you will have failures take that information from those failures and then apply it and learn from it and so it's exactly what's happening with the grow bags right um we can we, we, you know, we, we talked about all those different variables. We can start now testing those different variables in the future and see if we can improve upon that success rate. And, and taking those, um, those, those risks by, you know, using the grow bag, something we've never done before, yeah. we're actually, even when we fail, we're getting information. We're learning, okay, this is what works. This is what doesn't work. Here's how we can do things differently. And, and by taking these small, um, risks and then failing which is, is is actually just getting information it's not if we are afraid of putting 20 percent of our crop into these grow bags we're not going to learn anything so now we have some more information yeah. at this point than we did a month a month and a half ago and that's valuable and that's why making you know you know failing forward and, and making these these attempts to try something different really pay off in the long run versus doing nothing because you're worried what could go wrong. Yeah, and those quick decisions are about movement too, right? Mm. Because if you wait for the conditions to be perfect before you try something, then you're gonna accomplish very little, you know, if anything at all, honestly. Um, so being willing to try something, even if there's a possibility of failure, um, it's still movement in a direction, you know? So, so like you might fail, but you're ahead of where you were because like Rob just said, like you have more information on what works or what doesn't than if you had just stayed in one spot and, you know, been stagnant. And I think about all the times in my life that I did not take steps mm -hmm. because I felt like, oh, it, it wasn't the, quite the right time. And most of those things, I ended up not taking steps for one reason or another. And, um, didn't get anything out of it, didn't learn anything, didn't get the experiences. And, and that is what life's about. So I think, yeah. you know, you know, looking back at those times, I'm trying to use that experience of, okay, this is, it's not going to be a right moment. It's, this is going to be good enough. Let's go for it. Yeah. Failure. I mean, it's such an emotionally loaded mm -hmm. word for a lot of people because it's sort of, um, you know, is synonymous with an end point. 
Um, at least that's kind of like culturally how we tend to look at it. But I think that that's that's completely backwards, right? So failure should be a it should be a synonym for experience, and it shows that you've tried something, that you've moved forward, and that you're learning something in the process. It, it builds resiliency, you know, um, and and. The way I mean, it's so it's a component of grit. So if we look at grit as sort of like that, the, your ability to keep going when you experience struggles because you know because you've built upon the failures that have created resiliency, right? So you need resiliency as an attribute of grit, and the way that you can develop that is through um, trying something, using it as information, and continuing to try new things. So you know, I think a lot of people view failure as a sign that they don't belong in you know in the club that they're striving to be part of um but but that's just not true i mean the only reason that those people that you see in that club that you recognize as a success are recognized as a success is because they have been willing to get out there and fail and do things right and so all they have is more experience than you do and what that means is they've had more failures than you have and so you just kind of keep trying and doing the things you know having that the test and learn mindset right of, of you know iteratively um, improving and making changes you know the more you fail too I think the more let me put it this way the more you fail the less you are worried about failing because you learn that you can get back up you learn what you can get from it and it, it seems like people who are really scared to fail sometimes haven't failed a lot and they are just worried about that that whole thing so that's yeah i think well and that's a good point because it's about um like your tolerance for risk right so like um being very tolerant of risk or being sort of risk averse and um you know we have this dynamic actually in our relationship <laughs> and we always have and um you know it's okay so what i will say about you know risk and risk aversion is that it operates on a spectrum right so like on one end of the spectrum is a person who like well i guess on that extreme end of the spectrum is a person who's like impulsive and they they just jump without thinking and then on the other end is a person who is stagnant and doesn't move because um, you know they're too afraid of what might happen so really you don't want to be on either end of that spectrum because they're both you know not the most ideally healthy <laughs> behaviors I think it's dangerous for growth in some way yeah way absolutely yeah. you want to be somewhere in the middle right um, so okay so I mean it depends on the genre of thing we're talking about but I would say mm -hmm. generally speaking I am much less risk averse so I am much more willing to jump um, on most things compared to Rob, and 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 that makes us a good team because um, I guess because Rob helps to ground me and I help to pull him forward. And so, like, you know, when you drive a car, you need a gas pedal and you need a brake, right? You can't drive with just one or the other. And so, it works to have um, a little bit of a little both. bit of that balance. Yeah. In, in, in the relationship in this thing we're driving yeah but I mean this started like early in our relationship right yeah. so like when we first started dating <laughs> um, I was just completely upfront with him and I was like you know if if you want to date me I just want you to know that like I'm going to to Nepal and um, so you got to be along for that if you <laughs> if you want to date me and I mean right up until okay the night before we were getting ready to leave and we had our backpacks like all packed up and ready to go on the floor and we were going to be flying out the next day and rob was like kind of i don't know well frazzled so <laughs> i've traveled quite a bit uh different parts of the world but you got to realize you know nepal is is a little bit of a different country it's um it's, it's a developing a, country. it's a developing country um there's there's um a, you know um advisories out there in terms of you know making sure you know where the embassy is at because they're kind of just coming out of a little bit of the civil war um i've read all this literature about okay make sure you're not you know making eye contact with those monkeys on the street because they don't like that and um you know you make sure when you take the shower you're not opening your mouth because you can't get any of that water in your mouth and there's all these things i'm just like oh my gosh what are we doing um and uh yeah it was i it had a sense of of panic excitements but but also like what a, what am i getting myself into here um so so that i guess the brake pedal for me was probably would have been 
um, big enough that I would have gone on my own, but uh, having someone kind of, you know, help encourage me um, was, was what I needed to get over that and get on that plane. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like completely the opposite, right? Where I'm just like, let's go, you know? And, um, you know, Rob's kind of like, uh, can we check on some things first? You know, so <laughs> we kind of, we just have different approaches to some of those things like that. I mean, and I will say like this was, you know, over a decade ago. Um, so, you know, uh, certainly wouldn't want to deter anybody. Even a decade ago, I wouldn't have wanted to deter anybody from traveling to Nepal because it's a fantastic experience. Yeah. And I think um, you gain so much from interacting with other cultures and seeing how the rest of the world operates. And, um, you know, and so there are, there are like different risk tolerances, you know, um, and I think it changes throughout your life too, because um, we were talking about this this morning and how, you know, Rob recently climbed Mount Rainier and that is just absolutely something that I would not want to do at this point in my life. But if you had asked me like say 15 years ago, I would have been absolutely into that. I, I you know, if I had had the opportunity, I mean, I guess I always had the opportunity. <laughs> um, so I, I would have wanted to do that at that point in my life. But at this point in my life, I feel like that's where some of my, there's some risk aversion like coming into play there because it's just not aligned with my current goals and the risk of injury and, you know, the fact that like I've, I'm, I'm older now and so my body works differently and those sorts of things and the way that I want to use my body now is different. Um, I think like an injury climbing a mountain, well, it would make it a lot harder for me to farm dahlias. And so that's just like, you know, risk and benefit sort mm -hmm. of evaluation. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's about finding, you know, balance or harmony in the spectrum of riskiness and risk aversion. And I think part of it is also is about getting comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. Yeah. It's, it's feeling comfortable with that discomfort. I, I, a lot of times we do not, as, as people, as humans, don't like discomfort and, and how that feels yeah. but and, and so because of that we don't always take the risks or we don't always do the things that we really want to and really passionate about because we also don't want to feel that discomfort however when we do feel comfortable with that that's when things can really kind of take off and that's what we're trying to do is is embrace that when those those feelings come up yeah, and so I think about my dad a lot when it comes to this particular topic because one of the things that he's always told me whenever I've like pitched some like crazy idea of this thing that I want to do and I'm sort of like looking for some courage to go and try this thing is he'll sort of challenge me and say, what's the worst that could happen? And I actually think that my grandfather used to say that to him. So like this might be like a multi-generational sort of mantra, but yeah, what is the worst that can happen? And so we use that a lot when we're sort of evaluating, um, you know, choices that we want to make, like investing in next year's, you know, tulip bulbs or whatever it is, like, what's the worst that could happen here in this situation, you know? And most of the times, like, these aren't like life or death sort of things that are going to like make or break you. It just feels scary in the moment. So, so like with that risk and risk aversion thing, like, I don't want to discount the fact that sometimes you do have to sort of like listen to your instinct and your gut and you do it you know, want to jump when there's something that tells you that this is the right thing. And then there are other times where you want to be sort of thoughtful um, and and not be as impulsive and make sure that, you know, what you're doing is more prudent. But, you know, always asking yourself, like, what's the worst that can happen if I do this? It's kind of a really good, like, check in to see if this is the right path. And when I've asked that question in the past, sometimes I, I'll come to the conclusion that, you know, things might be different than the way they are now, which is not a bad thing. And the things you hold, you know, near and dear to your heart will still be there in your life, just will look different. And so sometimes you have to let go of what is right now to get to what you want that might be different in the future. Yeah, like I'm not, I'm certainly not going to go like cash out our 401k and put it all on <laughs> tickets for the next, you know, lottery drawing or something like that because that would be an impulsive decision that you know there's no research behind it it's just like completely risky right it, that doesn't make any sense um but you know most of the time people aren't trying to make like big decisions like that but you can see how um you know putting in a little bit of time and effort can you know to figure out what you really want and and whether it's a sound decision you have the best available information that you have then you can start doing these trials and be willing to fail and things like that
We have a whole lot more of experimenting still to do this season. And we probably should get to it right now. We probably should. And so while we get back to it, we hope that you guys will go subscribe to our channel and follow our homesteading journey. And we really hope that you are also cultivating the life of your dreams. So until next time, we'll see you in a few days. Have a good day. That was a big bee. Did you see that? I didn't see him. I just heard something fly by. It was a bee? You saw it? Yeah. Small helicopter. We have a whole lot more experimenting still to do this season. And he has no <laughs> idea what his line is next. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> okay. Action. <laughs> oh. Did you see it that time? No. I just hear him flying by. I don't see him. <laughs>